we have a lot to do today, and we're in part three of a who knows how long part series. Uh, it's still being written. Uh, the first part of the series, the first week, we took a look at the multiplicity of verses and, that prove that God's love is infinite, that it's given to every single human being, and so is his grace. The Bible even tells us repeatedly that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world and that God sent him to earth because he so loved the world. In the second week, we looked at the nearly forgotten fact among Christians in the West, both Protestants and Catholics, that the early church, or at least a very large portion of them, believed that God would eventually save everyone. We also revealed a list of those teaching the ancient teaching of universal reconciliation throughout history, their voices sometimes stifled by the majority, but still there, powerful, insistent to this very day. And that brings us to a rather large question. What about hell? Isn't hell the ultimate destination of the vast majority of humans alive now or who have ever been alive? Isn't it a torture pit that will for eternity burn, terrify, and punish all of those not in Christ forever and ever? That's what many of us have been taught. Maybe we should look at hell. The first problem with doing so is figuring out what the word even means. Where is it? What is it? In fact, if you take a look at the word hell as translated in some versions of the Bible, you'll find that there are four different words translated hell sometimes in Scripture. Sheol, Hades, Gehenna, and Tartarus. If you have a King James version of the Bible, you'll find the word hell a lot. It is in your Bible 54 times. 31 times in the Old Testament, 23 times in the New Testament. If, however, you have the New King James Version of the Bible, you'll find hell mentioned a lot less. 32, not 54. 19 times in the Old Testament, 13 times in the New Testament. Hmm, where did hell go? Well, we've got more on this. If you've got a New International Version, an American Standard Version, a New American Standard Version, Revised Standard Version, or New Revised Standard Version. If you've got a New Living Bible Translation, New Century Translation, English Standard Bible, the New American Bible, Young's Literal Translation, almost, we could just keep naming them. You're going to find the word hell exactly zero times in the Old Testament. From 31 to zero and in the New Testament, according to which of those versions you have, you, you might see it up to 13 times in the New Testament, down from 23, to, and a lot of them, zero. Now, there are those that will say the King James Version is the only version, and that all the other versions are perversions, and they're erasing hell, but it's just simply not true. As um, King James, if you'll remember, was a Scotsman. So let me just talk to you bluntly on this one. Uh, his scholars did the best they could with what they had. But what they had were copies of copies of copies, very late manuscripts, corrupted manuscripts. But they still produced a beautiful, beautiful text that has taken millions of people to Christ. So we don't diss it by any stretch of the imagination. But is it pure is it perfect? No. No, not at all. Let's start. We're going to work our way back to King James in a bit. But let's start way back where the confusion about hell started. Last week we talked about that there were six centers of Christian faith. And one of them, North Africa, were the ones who taught that, he, uh, that hell was an eternal torture pit for all who did not know Christ, the vast majority of humanity. Uh, and it even taught that part of the joy of heaven was being able to look over and see them being tortured in hell. And that's, a, that's offensive to most of us. I think it should be shocking to most of us. But it started there in North Africa and even all the way up to John Calvin, he would teach the same. Where did it get started? Right there with a man we met before, Tertullian, if you remember him. He's the one who first started writing that what Paul had said in Timothy and Corinth, uh, 
meant that women were uh, bearers of the sin of Eve and should be ashamed that they were even daughters of Eve and never allowed to speak in public. And then following him, you had what most people, and I'm going to really struggle on this, most people call him Augustine. He would have called himself Augustine, and everybody would have called him that for a very long time. But in America, he's Augustine. So pray for me. We're going to try to use that name. Augustine was a very uh, fascinating character. He was born into money, and he lived a riotous life. He sampled every single sin possible as many times as possible. And then when he came to belief in Christ, he came to what would soon be called a heresy, and then eventually worked his way into the mainstream. If you read Rubenstein's book, When Jesus Became God, it is a story of those 300 years of fighting, and Augustine was right in the middle of it and a ringleader in a lot of it. Uh, we're talking actual riots in the streets, overthrows and such, churches divided, churches going to war against each other. It was a pretty rough time. Augustine was a very, very wise man, except he didn't like Greek. He didn't like his Greek teachers. He didn't like the language. He refused to learn it. So his translations that he wrote and read and did all were Latin. So translations of translations of translations. And whenever he did translate scripture, sometimes he did it poorly. When he came across a word like Sheol, Gehenna, Hades, or Tartarus, he pulled a Latin word that he borrowed from Greek philosophy. Consistency has never been a human thing. From Plato, Socrates, that era, hundreds of years, centuries of years before Jesus. He pulled a word that they used they believed in, in, in ancient Greek culture that when you died, everybody went to a very dark place of mourning and shadows and discomfort and pain and crying, and that was it. That was it. There was, there was no exit from there. And he grabbed that word inferno and stuck it in here, and it was then stuck in our scriptures. He would later become... A, um, a father, a church father, and therefore his writings as you know, the city of God and such are still read and still quoted to this very day. Uh, very, very important, and, and please don't, under, don't misunderstand me. I don't want to slander the man. He did what he could with what he had at the time, but this was a big mistake. Later, King James people would come along, and they didn't quite use the same word they wanted to use a word which meant covered, hidden, and kept from us. And they used the word hell. For you see, Old English and Middle English is what they used in the King James. Middle English would be like Shakespearean English. Uh, the word hell meant something covered or hidden. In fact, to put on a hat would be helling your head. We don't use the word that way now. A roofer was known as a heller. Unless they used thatch and then they were thatchers. Or slate, then they were slater. And that's where those last names come from. But otherwise, it was a heller. It was a generic term for a hidden, something hidden out of sight. A mysterious, thrown away place. Tailors, when they had scraps of cloth or le leather that they couldn't use, would just toss them into a bin, um, a trash can. And the, the name for that was hell. We don't get that because we don't speak that language anymore. I am blessed that I grew up and able to be in education where I know the Middle English. I also know the, the Old English. In fact, the, I, I was outed. I took Old English at West Virginia University just because I wanted to take courses and that was on offer. And most of the Old English things we have, the manuscripts that we have, deal with scriptural issues or their scripture. And so he'd set us a task to translate, and I'd just start translating, and he, he would look over and he'd say, Do you, did you know Old English before? And I'd say, nope. He then found out, but I knew scripture. And he said, we have someone among us with an advantage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know what these are. 
So when I read these things, I don't perhaps see what you see, but it's just that simple. One translator making a change, then that change becomes permanent the way we've always done it. King James made a lot of these as well. After the scholars brought him the translation, he sent them back to make some changes. King James, the first of Scotland, um, I'm, I'm sorry, the, I think the fifth of Scotland, the first of England, uh, he, he had some political things he wanted to put in there. For example, at that time, the word deacon was a church office. In the Bible, it means servant or minister. And so they had translated it servant or minister. He said, send it back and put deacon in there. And so what they did was what's called a transliteration, where you take a word in another language, in this instance, Greek, diakonos, and you just put English letters in and you make a new word. That's where we get the word baptize, because the word baptizo means to immerse. Well, they weren't immersing at that time, so he wanted that sent back, and they made a new word, baptize. He did this with several things. Um, no version is completely pure, but they will all get you to Jesus. So there's no reason for us to get into slap fights about versions. They will get you to Jesus, but you might have some weird ideas because somebody did a word choice. When Augustine put the word hell into scripture in his writings, it had a massive impact on the early church. The church in Rome was in constant competition with the church in Constantinople. This would continue until, well, in some ways until the present day. Pope John Paul II actually did a uh, rapprochement to bring them together. Um, that was only, what, 20, 30 years ago now? But until then, a lot of pressure. And before then, they would actually put armies in the field against each other. And as we brought up last week, sometimes they would even ally with the incoming Muslims to attack the other side. This was, this was a bad time for Christians. They, they, we weren't acting as Christians. But when the Church of Rome gained ascendancy, they made uh, Augustine a doctor of the faith. And his words were considered inspired and accepted as doctrine of the church universal all were bound to it. But he didn't just bring in the word. He brought all that mythic baggage with it. Including, he didn't understand what the words in Greek and Hebrew for ages, times, and lengths of times, eons, meant. And so he plugged in eternal. As we will find out in a couple of weeks, he plugged in the wrong word. But for now, more important, the reputation of God as a God of love and Christ as the embodiment of love and the Savior of all suffered. God's reputation suffered. When I was a boy, I sat in worship services terrified because we were told constantly we were on the verge of going to hell. All of us, especially the, the dirty little boys sitting there. And uh, I, the preacher had a point, you know, we, we all couldn't say, not us, you know, oh, fair, fair play. Uh, and it would, I remember we had a church building once with a metal roof, bad idea, and a huge storm was going. You could barely hear the preacher, but he was still ranting at us. And he was saying the next crack of thunder could be the coming of Jesus and that not all of us would be rising, that things were going to rise. This is really hard to square with going to people and saying, now the gospel's good news. Look at, this is what we're going to do now. Because to, to, to go over this honestly and fairly, we have to look at every instance of the, of the use of these words and show that you can tell, no matter what version you use, that we've misunderstood the words. So that's why we're peeling this onion very slowly. And I, I just, before I do that, real quick, immediately people start saying, but, but, but you're saying people that are sinners are just going to get away with it. No, the Bible does talk about punishment, and we're going to talk a lot about that later. But for right now, just to help you, as one person said to me, you're, you're saying that they're going to get away with it. And I looked at them and I said, D have you listened to yourself? Aren't you going to get away with it? You're a Christian. You were baptized. 
and all those sins, and the sin since then, you've asked to be forgiven or forgiven, so you die and go to heaven, yes? And they're nodding very slowly now because they're starting to get it. And I'm saying, so you just got away with it. How fair is that? Well, and they, they start, why don't we just let God decide who gets into heaven and how that's done instead of us being the hellfire scare them in the church thing? I was scared into the church. And that's the reason why it was so easy for me to leave it. It was the love of Christ that got me in and kept me. So maybe we should try that. All right, let's go. Sheol appears 65 times in the Old Testament. The King James translates it 31 times as hell. 31 times as grave. Three times as pit. There's no consistency here. Sheol, by the way, is just a general term meaning where people go when they die. There's no specificity to it at all. In the Bible, both righteous and unrighteous go to Sheol. And if we're being precise, we can add that the Bible does say in the Old Testament a couple times that the righteous will not be abandoned in Sheol. But that's about it. There's no more information in the Old Testament than that. When Jacob was shown the blood-stained coat of Joseph, when his brothers were trying to fool him into that Joseph was, is dead. Is it, wasn't this goat? What happened? Jacob said he would go down to Sheol in mourning, which just merely meant I will mourn him the rest of my life. We all understand that, do we not? We all have, we've all lost people that we will miss the rest of our life. When Hannah's prayer for a son is answered, she said, the Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up which I find a remarkable statement of faith because to that point, this is the book of Samuel, there has been no teaching on what happens after death in the Old Testament. But she believes, as with Job, that God can still reach us in Sheol. Job said he'd rather go to Sheol than to live in the misery he was experiencing. Job 14, 13. I remind you, all the notes, all the scriptures are in a document that are in the description box on the YouTube version of our video. We are now also pushing this to X, which is great. In this day of censorship, it's nice to have options. And uh, X will not censor us. So there we are. David said that when he made his bed in Sheol, God would still be with him. So they didn't have the Plato-Socratic view of hell or death. They believed that even after death, God was there. And that you were somewhere, somehow with God. That's in Psalm 139, verse 8. And it isn't just people that go to Sheol. Everything goes. In the book of Noah, uh, I'm sorry, there's not a book of Noah. (laughs) We do not have secret books, sorry. In the book of Numbers, Korah rebelled against God. And when the earth opened, everything he had went down. All of his possessions and all that he owned, the scripture says, went into Sheol. By the way, I preached an entire sermon once from the, the book of Elijah. I meant Isaiah. I thought I was saying Isaiah. I was wondering why the people were smiling at me the entire service. It wasn't a smiley kind of church. Uh, but later, I learned what had happened. So it's not the first time it's happened. Of course, now it's broadcast around the world, so there's that. Most versions of the Bible that you've got will correct the mistakes made by earlier translators who, again, did the best they could with what they had. And they will say, go down to the grave. An example would be Proverbs 5, 5. An adulterous woman, her feet go down to death. The King James would say, her steps lead to hell. That's a very different thing, isn't it? Her way of life will take you to death. When Jonah was in the belly of the fish, by the way, and I say fish because the Old Testament refers to it as a fish. And when Jesus uses the word whale, it's a generic term meaning big thing in the water. So you can call it a whale if you want to because they're, they're cute in the cartoons, but I don't know what it was. When he was in the belly of the fish, he declared himself dead and in hell. King James Version says. 
you heard me when I was in hell. Now, while we might say being swallowed up by a fish feels like you're in hell, the word means I was in the grave, in the belly of the fish, and you heard my voice. There's no single, not one, instance in the Old Testament of any word or any concept that there existed anywhere a torture pit for the unrighteous. There's not one word. In fact, I'll read to you now every passage that Paul mentions hell and every passage that John in his epistles mentions hell. Would you like me to read them again? They never mention it. Were you aware of that? The vast majority of the New Testament being, well, it's not a majority, more books than anyone else, Paul wrote, never mentions it. Isn't it interesting? It becomes a center point of evangelism in some places to scare people to Christ. In the New Testament, the word Hades is used. uh, Hades is the Greek version of Sheol. is used 10 or 11 times, depending on your translation. King James Version translates it as hell every single time. The NIV translates it as hell only in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, which I've always wondered why they did that, even though I I adore, use the NIV. Why does no other modern version use the word hell in the New Testament? Well, it's because for Hades. It's because Hades just means Sheol. It means the grave. It's used often... um, um, metaphorically, symbolically, like it was by Jonah. Uh, Matthew eleven twenty three, 23. Capernaum is under judgment, a city. And sa- they are said, they will go down to the grave. In the King James, it says, go down to hell. All Jesus is saying is saying, you are judged and you will cease to be on this planet. In Matthew 16, 18, I love Matthew 16, 18, because I misunderstood it for most of my life. You know, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I thought all my life, all right, that means stand on Christ, and hell can't get you. Gates are not offensive weapons. Gates are defensive. And once we realize hell means death, Jesus is saying, you believe in me, and we will break open the gates of death. And in fact, he does. Rather than teaching that Jesus is a place of endless punishment, Jesus is saying his church will destroy the very gates of death, releasing those behind them. If you want an example of that, Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, the angel declares that Jesus holds the keys to Hades and death. And in Revelation 20 and verse 13, Jesus uses the keys to unlock those trapped in death, in Hades. We don't often talk about that. Or how about this? The passage most often brought up to prove that Hades is hell is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. By the way, the word there that is translated hell isn't even Hades or Sheol. It only occurs one time, Tartarus. And it merely means in pain, torment. So that said, moving on, if you don't know the story, and we know we have a lot of Muslims, we have some agnostics that watch, a couple atheists, thank you for always being so kind in your emails uh, and respectful in the questions. And we hope that we're respectful when we reply. We also have a lot of unchurched folk. Rich man and Lazarus, Jesus told a parable. That's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning is how it's always defined. It just means a story to illustrate a spiritual truth. There's a rich man who lives sumptuously every day. At his gate is a poor beggar named Lazarus who is covered with sores and has had a miserable life. And Lazarus dies and he's carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, which I love that phrase. And then the rich man dies and is buried and he opens his eyes in Tartarus, in torment. Well, that's a story that is often used to prove that, well, the grave is hell. Well, first of all, he's said to be in the place of the dead, Hades, not hell. 
He's in torment, but that doesn't mean eternity. We still have more to go. The book of Revelation just showed us that death and Hades is not permanent. Another, it's a parable. You say things in stories that are not to be taken literally. Another, this story proves... I'm sorry, let me back up. This story is told before Christ conquers death on the cross. Do you remember what Peter said happened when Christ was in the grave? Where was he? We know where the body was, but where was Christ? Where was his spirit? Some people will say he must have been in heaven with his father. He said he wasn't. Do you remember when he was resurrected? Mary is there. Not his mother Mary. One of the other many Marys in there. A Mary Magdalene. And she hugs him and he says, touch me not. That's the King James phrase. Always comes to mind. It, It almost means ouch. As in hugging too hard. Don't hold on to me. Because I have not yet ascended to my father. But where was he? Peter says he went and preached to the spirits that were in prison in Hades. Hmm. Because of time, we're only going to look at one more word today. We've got a couple more to look at next week. And then we're going to take a look at the words for eternity. The word Gehenna. You might have heard it said that Jesus spoke more about hell than anybody else. And that is absolutely correct, except it isn't. The word is often translated hell, but he spoke of Gehenna. What is Gehenna? It is the Valley of Hennam, which is outside of Jerusalem. It's mentioned 13 times in the Old Testament, always as a place of idol worship. Now, because we have house churches that watch this, I will not go into any details about their worship because we have little ears in the room. For the grown-ups, you can look up Molech in particular, but also Dagon as a a more minor character. But the main player that was worshipped in the Valley of Hinnom or Gehenna was Molech, and he was worshipped by sacrificing your child to them. And it was done in the most hideous atrocious, painful ways imaginable. And for most of us, it's not even imaginable until we read about it. Because of this, good King Josiah, you remember he's the one, they found the book of the law, and then uh, the prophetess, the priestess, Huldah, uh, helps him revamp the law so that the people will now follow the law. And they will turn to God. Because, because now we're turning back to Yahweh. We have found the book of the law. And, and interesting, isn't it? We just found it in the temple. Nobody had been using them, or even the temple, evidently. So they turn back to Yahweh. He then looks over and sees what's going on in the Valley of Hemnon and says, well, the law is very plain. That's not acceptable. So he turned it into a garbage pit where people would throw the bodies of unclean animals and the bodies of criminals the evil would be tossed into it. They would have no funeral and no burying ground. If you want to know the story of that, 2 Kings chapter 23 is where you'll find it. According to Ecclesiastes 6 verse 3, being thrown into there with no burial, no funeral, no period of mourning was the worst fate they could imagine. To die unmourned, uncared for, and thrown into the pit. Jeremiah 7 declares it a sign of judgment of God on those who refuse to obey God. The bodies, once again, of animals, waste, they didn't have plumbing, waste, garbage, and the bodies of evil people were tossed there, and fires were lit to consume them. And so that imagery is used. More next week. But know this, were the fires of Gehenna eternal? No, they're not burning today. Did a body burn for eternity? It burns up, it's gone. Fire is there to purify and cleanse. 
And again, we have little ears, so I'm not going to go into great detail here. Those of you in the military, uh, regardless of whether it's stateside, British, or whatever, you know that you have latrines that you have to create. And then those latrines need to be emptied out because health reasons. And those of you that, are, that served as privates know that when you got on the bad side of your sergeant, you had to deal with the burn barrel. You had to get all the muck, shall we say, and put it into a barrel and incinerate it. That's the only way to get rid of it. But it's gotten rid of. It's not there forever. It is there to purify and cleanse. And the fires that are mentioned in scripture are there to purify and cleanse, not to torture forever. Think of it this way. We always want to do this, don't we? We always want to mention Hitler, so let's just do it. We get Hitler. I asked uh, ask prisoners this this last week in Louisiana State Penitentiary. I said, um, does he deserve the death penalty? And the answer was absolutely. And then the, it's too good for him. I'm talking to people on death row, and they're saying, no, that's too good for them. You know? And I'm going, okay, what if we tie him to a stake out here and light him on fire? Would that be appropriate? And the answer was, yeah. And I said, so we could all sit around and watch him burn, screaming and the like. And prisoners are rough, so they're saying yes. I said, how long? Got real quiet. I said, should we sit out there for 10,000 years? Should he burn that long? A couple of them said yes. I said, fair enough. Thank you for answering the question. What if we sit out there for 100,000 years? When does it go from being punishment to just torture for torture's sake? When do we get sick of watching this? And every one of them, the light went on behind their eyes. Fire was used to purify and cleanse. It is not used because our God is so evil that what you have done over a period of, shall we say, 70 years, I'm really close to that myself, 70 years must be punished with trillions of years. More on that next week and the week after. But again, for those of you that are terrified, we might do away with the hell that you would like for some people to go to. And I understand that. I really do. Uh, I I get that. Uh, I've been hurt too. I get it. Let me assure you of this. We're going to go where the words take us. The words that were given to us as a community of Christ on earth. The scriptures. The Bible does not say that the evil will not face punishment. It absolutely says they will. The Bible does not say there are no consequences for sin. The Bible absolutely says that there are. Those that have not been forgiven by, uh, by, by Christ do face a period of refining. How does that work? We'll get there. But the numbers on the screen tell me I've already gone over my limit for today. So I must have patience and so must you. In the meantime, how about this? Let's just turn to Jesus so none of us have to worry about this. Let's love others so much that they turn to Jesus so that they're not concerned about this. Because we're no longer concerned about fire. We have turned to the light. And that light was the life of all mankind.